Hi everybody and welcome to our webinar on multi-mode waveguide interconnect systems. This is the ninth in a series of webinars presented by Kobo, which is the consortium for onboard optics and sponsored by DuPont Silicon Valley Technology Center. So when we consider the future switchboard designs, the interconnect between components will need to scale both in the density of bandwidth while reducing the power consumption. In this webinar, we'll be discussing the use of embedded optical waveguides uh, in, in the PCB as, and the requisite connectors and media adapters as a next-gen alternative to copper traces. So as many of you may know, last September, Kobo initiated a new working group to address multi-mode multi waveguide interconnect systems, or MWIS. Our first presenter today is Joshua Kim, who is the chair of that working group. And he's also a senior integrity engineer in photonics and electronics at Heroes Electric USA. After his presentation, we'll hear from Marika Imonen, who is a manager for R&D Optical Interconnects at TTM Technologies, which is one of the leading suppliers of advanced PCBs. So after this presentation or after this webinar, which should uh, last for one hour, we should have plenty of time for Q&A. Uh, the audience is welcome to submit uh, your questions. Please use the Q&A function that you see at the, at the bottom of the Zoom screen. And if you could please indicate if the question is for Joshua or for Marika, that, that would be great. We'll get to as many of the questions as we can. And so with that, Let's kick it off. Let's get started. Joshua, the floor is all yours. So good morning, good afternoon, good, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Joshua Kihong Kim, a principal engineer at Hirose Electric US and the chairman of a new working group called Multimode Waveguide Interconnect System, in short, MOEs. MWIS has been formed recently at COBO Consortium on Board Optics. The goal for MWIS is to scale performance in bandwidth and power consumption, especially beyond 100 gig per lane interconnect system in PCB. So let's take a closer look at the component of MWIS. Uh, MWIS is the uh, optical interconnect system embedded right at the printed circuit board along with conventional copper traces. The picture on the right shows the embedded optical multi-mode waveguide as an uh, example. Here you can see a zoom in small waveguide array along with conventional copper traces and a through hole bias. These waveguides carry optical signal that is generated by EO converter and terminated by the OE converter, populated on the same PCB to interconnect uh, between two chips or chip to module. As such, MWIS is composed of several elements to build a channel. There are a very thin EO-OE converter, which we called media adapter, or simply MA, and a very short copper trace to drive such MAs from existing services. And finally, a polymer-based multimode waveguide itself with associated optical couplers. The details of this MS manufacturing uh, background related topics and some of the project outline will be covered by our next speaker, Marika Imonen from TTM. Before we share the details on how the upscale performance could be achieved, I'd like to share the implementation scope of MWIS in this slide. First, the optical uh, waveguide is always terminated by a pair of media adapters. Second, MWIS allows some copper trace length, but doesn't exclude zero length copper option. Third, the least possible amount of hardware is recommended for MA implementation, 
in order to reduce the overall power consumption, but just to meet the targeted channel BR. Because both optical and electrical channel length to be driven by media adapter is extremely small compared to the ones for the typical optical module that we are familiar with today. At least 50 times to few thousand times smaller. Finally, the channel performance in terms of bandwidth and power consumption should be assessed in the electrical domain with the optical channel inclusive. The figure at the left here shows two implementation method, MPO-like implementation and CPO-like implementation, especially for chip to module application. What I mean by MPO-like and CPO-like is that one can restructure the existing MPO module, which has fiber as default interface into the one with optical waveguide embedded in PCB. Same story goes to CPU-like MA implementation. A special note should be made here, especially for chip to module application. In MWIS implementation, unlike MPO or CPO approach, the conventional optical pluggable module can still be populated at the face plate. This guarantees the backward compatibility in system integration perspective, while just inbox interconnect engines are upgraded for the future proof hyperscale cloud. This shows chip to chip example to complete the implementation scenario. Now we want to move into the power efficiency topic. Let's quickly review the conventional copper channel shown in this box. The service drive transmission line of characteristic impedance of G0 with the spec of insertion loss, return loss, crosstalk, etc., and possibly the stress signal spec at the RX service through such lossy and impaired transmission line. Here I specifically mentioned about characteristic impedance because it is an important system parameter for the power calculation. As the speed of the copper channel increases, we know that the insertion loss of the nitrous frequency is increased due to the PCB material and copper loss. This increases power consumption. But that's not the only one as engineers have squeezed the bits into a Shannon limit. It also increased the number of bits dwelling in each physical discontinuities such as connectors and vias. And we know that the nature of, uh, natural recommendation for digital equalizers is to increase the number of taps accordingly. In short, the power consumption is no longer a simple linear function of operational frequency, but it becomes an exponential function of uh, frequency. This chart shows numbers in red in here to tell how much each type of service consumes power in average when implemented compliant to the pertained specifications in here. Note that the numbers were collected from mobile communication with OEM vendors. So no guarantee is given to use for other purposes, but it provides enough information to use as a parameter, which you want to change later if desired. In any case, as a summary, PCB copper connection limit, it's insertion loss, 28, 20, 16, and 10 dB, 
depending on the application classes of channel, which are LR, MR, VSR, and XSR in OF term. Note that this is 100 gig service with PAMPO technology based. Now we know the length in dB. We have pico joule per bit information ready. We could calculate the slope of energy per bit for a fictitious service design. Or reversely, we can calculate by this how much power one could save if we reduce the copper trace length. From the first order linear curve fitting, we finally got energy per bit slope for copper of 0.35 picojoule per bit derived from the collected data. With this, as an example, if we can reduce the copper trace of X dB, then the power saving would become X by 0.35 picojoule per bit. This is important result for the architectural decision on whether MWIS approach for a specific application is appropriate or not. Now uh, let's look at the power consumption for MWIS case in detail. Uh, like conventional PCB channel, TX service should drive all the discontinuities but possibly with very short length of trace of the specified characteristic impedance again. Then it is followed by the transconductance stage, LD, waveguide, photodetector, photodiode, trans impedance, and finally, so this through the short trace again. Now, by comparing this with the conventional copper channel shown in the upper box, we have uh, service is in common between the two. The only difference is power consumption uh, is its additional MA blocks. With the possible scenario of optical losses and the worst case of pixel and PD operational conditions, and with simple transconductance amp and trend impedance amp uh, with their gains to compensate the possible optical loss in multimode waveguide with related optics. We ended up with 352 femtojoule per bit maximum power consumption for this particular MS channel example. Note that the number is not coming from the exhaustive analysis, but rather to get the first order hint for the viability check of the method. Now we uh, assuming an MS channel is equipped with the fictitious service designed by the design law of energy per bit slope derived in the previous chart and with minimal copper trace of 1 dB interface. Now we have uh, through simple math 0.7 picojoule per bit or sub picojoule per bit uh, overall power consumption, even with MAs, media adapters. This result may be compared with six to 10 picojoule per bit of typical power consumption of LR application, which has comparable interconnection length to this particular MUS channel model. Now let's switch gear to the channel bandwidth topic. The optical channel model is composed of optical connector from light source and multi-mode, including possible misalignment, d -miss, between the coupler and waveguide, considering the assembly tolerances. For this simulation, we have used eigenmode uh, expansion tool with the configuration setup of maximum mode number of 100. 
Here is some animation using the field plots by increasing the length of multi-mode waveguide. This shows the dual nature of optical signal in the waveguide. That is wave and ray nature of light, which are coexisting in this simulation due to rather larger physical dimension we are dealing with compared to intra-chip dimension of silicon photonics application. So it is very important to perform optical signal integrity analysis based on the extracted S parameter for holistic EOE simulation. This chart shows impulse response of the optical channel model. The upper row shows 25 centimeter long multi-mode waveguide with a bearing misalignment distance in micrometer and lower ones shows 50 centimeter long case. As you can see, 50 centimeter multimode uh, waveguide channel shows more pulse broadening than 25 centimeter one. More importantly, there is no extra modal impairment due to the possible mode disturbances from any optical misalignment, as opposed to what we had initially concerned about. However, we have seen non-monotonic decrease of power due to the wave nature of optical signal as you increase the displacement from zero to maximum to of 14 micrometer. This chart shows top level block diagram of MATLAB simulation code for the simul, uh, signal integrity analysis of the holistic EOE channel and some results of waveform and spectrum at each test point uh, before and after electrical TX filter, after multimode waveguide, optical domain, the electrical RX filter. In here, no digital equalizers are yet applied. Starting from left baseband NRG pattern vector enters into this multimode waveguide through frequency up conversion to around 300 terahertz carrier frequency domain and experience optical S parameters as to one and goes down conversion back to the baseband domain with linear electrical filter, in this case, Gaussian filter. As you can see, the uh, proper electrical filter setting, it shows wide open line at this, in this uh, figure. This chart shares uh, further details on the eye diagram analysis. Left column shows a 100 gig case with no filter, second with TX electrical filter, and the last one is TX and RX electrical filter both on. So the last one shows the same eye diagram that I shown in a previous chart. And shifting to the next column, uh, it shows how eye diagram degrades as we increase the speed from 150 to 250, uh, even with both filters on. You could see more modal impairment appears as you increase the speed. In the last column shows eyes at 250 gig speed with both filters on for misalignment in this case for zero and seven micrometer and 14 micrometer of misalignment. Considering 48 by 48 micrometer uh, multimode waveguide structure, 14 micrometer is about 30% of the waveguide feature size. With this offset, it still shows the wide open eye, but with reduced average optical power, which can be linearly amplified by trans impedance amp or transconductance amp. However, most importantly, the modal impairment does not change its shape, even with the varying misalignment amount, which is very encouraging and important result since 
MWIS implementation scope allows electrical cylinders to equalize such deterministic impairment as purposely designed. This is the last chart for summary we have reviewed. PCB embedded polymer-based long optical multimode waveguide with very thin EO and OE converter called media adapter together with very short copper trace forms a newly proposed interconnect system called MWIS. MWIS architecture has been reviewed as a future proof solution for a new PCB interconnect system in the power consumption and bandwidth breakthrough perspective. MWIS channel can be implemented with extremely lower energy consumption, even with the addition of EO OE module. Optical S21 is extracted with misalignment uh, variation and reviewed through the channel impulse response to assess the model impairment. Eye diagram with linear electrical filter shows promising result. However, nonlinear time varying filters can also be further applied as an encouraging next topic where electrically equivalent S21 is to be formulated for standard and industry activity. With the dedicated electrical service and filters for MWIS channel, there seems no fundamental limit to scale up the bandwidth to 200 and 300 terahertz of optical carrier. This concludes my presentation. Now, uh, next uh, presenters uh, is from Marika. Now it's your turn, Marika. Thank you. Thank you, Joshua. Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Thank you, Joshua, for the uh, introduction. Uh, so now we are going to continue with looking at um, advanced PCBs with optical in waveguide interconnects on the ecosystem readiness and technical, let's say, uh, attributes, how the boards are being built, what's the uh, technology readiness level uh, for these boards. And I'm gonna directly jump into the Ethernet bandwidth uh, uh, speed transition roadmap. So in, um, obviously industry roadmaps are driving us for higher speed. We are seeing the a switch capacity doubling every 18 to 20 months, either in the number of uh, channels or the channel speed. So currently we're seeing that uh, 100 gig CERT is, is, is being implemented in systems and um, the 200 gig CERT is, is ahead of us in very near future. Um, these speed, speed transitions and high speed channels are, are really driving material selection testing requirements, via structures, and many other critical design attributes in, in our PCBs. So uh, 100, 100 gig node is, is, is already the, the, the speed node that we are seeing the transitions uh, from copper to optical, uh, especially, uh, uh, for example, in the form of a, of a CPO and other technologies. So moving on, uh, describing or discussing uh, the electro-optical PCB uh, that um, we're, we're uh, discussing. Uh, here is a schematic of an AO PCB with waveguides. So the scope is, is really to provide additional high capacity optical tracing layer, part of a regular PCB, which means that we can add on the optical functionality into regular products uh, with, with copper layers and interconnects. This means that we are adding functionality where it makes sense, where it, uh, it provides value. Uh, obviously, besides the optical uh, waveguiding layer, the tracing layer, we need optical connectors and coupling structures to couple light in, uh, in and out from the waveguides to the devices and in some application off the board. Um, this schematic um, indicates one uh, potential construction, but obviously uh, the optical layer can locate virtually in any layer in the stack. Um, uh, 
uh, however, the optical coupling solution usually sets some mechanical requirements for the layer location in the stack. Uh, the technology that we are gonna, let's say, look at uh, in the following slides will indicate that the technology is scalable uh, and it fits to various products and form factors. So we can uh, implement this optical waveguide technology into modules, cards, and, and backplanes. Here you see a, a, um, a fabricated or an example of an OE PCB product with 16 cup layers and one optical layer. So obviously uh, this uh, uh, cross section in, uh, shows us that the um, optical layer uh, built here in the middle of the stack um, provides the, the channels part of the regular, your regular uh, product. The changes are minimal but still adding these uh, highest speed or replacing the highest speed signal layers by the optical waveguides. We can see here 14 plus 14 channels built uh, in, in, a, um, in a regular uh, product with all micro V layers, uh, uh, plated through holes and other uh, electrical functionalities. Um, here, obviously we, we have the, developed the process to support that. Uh, the materials are compliant, and uh, the process can be handled with the with the uh, regular PCB factories. So, moving on to discuss on the the fabrication itself, um, optical layer and the materials that are that are intended and developed for this application obviously needs to be compliant for the rest of the the PCB, the copper layers, the dielectrics. The processes that we have. Um, here is a, a, a simplified schematic of the, of the process of how to build the waveguide, the waveguiding layer. Uh, it, it fundamentally constructs of, of three um, layers, three optical material layers. We, we call it CLAD1 optical core and CLAD2. They form the similar st uh, structure as we see in a fiber. So we have to have a, a, a optical tracing, optical signal carrying uh, core surrounded by, by all its sides uh, with the cladding. So we can start uh, uh, the fabrication from a naked core or a sub core. We uh, deposit the, the cladding, the first cladding layer onto it. The, the methods that can be used depends upon the material. If the material is a liquid, obviously we follow the liquid material uh, coating techniques. If it's a tri film, we can laminate uh, the cladding onto the, 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 the carrier. Uh, following that, we deposit again the optical core material layer and we photo image uh, the optical traces. Uh, we um, develop the, the traces and then we seal the structure by CLAD2. As we use the photo lithographic process, it's obvious that we can build the uh, all the traces of the optical waveguide core traces within one single uh, process step. That provides a huge advantage uh, compared to the fiber, for example, the fibers, because now we can uh, realize huge amount of hundreds or, or even more waveguides within one single process step. Obviously, um, after the, the waveguide processing, we'll continue the uh, remaining electrical st uh, uh, steps. We uh, laminate or stack the optical layer, if we will, into the board uh, by using a regular laminations. And here is an example of, of exactly that. So optical PCB fabrication flow, uh, 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 after forming the waveguide layer, we add the layer into the, the PCB, uh, um, depending upon where, where the lo layer locates. But here is a, just an indication of N layer, uh, N, N copper layer plus one optical um, uh, in, um, in, in uh, process step wise. So without uh, uh, emphasizing, but obviously the materials must pass through all regular processes lamination cycles, drilling, metallization steps. So materials have been qualified to, to pass these steps and be compliant for, uh, for the materials and tests. Finally, we route uh, the units 
we have to do, of course, the uh, the cavities, optical uh, uh, windows, and all that uh, uh, steps. We have uh, developed uh, uh, process steps that utilize standard fabrication procedures so that we can um, really uh, provide the OEPCB boards in a regular form factors, large panel sizes for cost and compliance uh, for, the, for the products. Here are some uh, uh, physical realizations of a panel, of a PCB core panel with, with the, these transparent waveguides. So you can see here in a, in a um, larger picture of, uh, of a panel where we have uh, a straight waveguides, we have a certain, uh, let's say, overcrossing sections um, uh, indicating that, that really the waveguides can be built um, within one single layer and uh, we fabricate them in, in one single step. Uh, another, let's say, uh, uh, novel attribute is that we can put them very densely um, as we can uh, cross over to waveguide channels within one layer. So these 90, 90 degrees, 75, 45, 450 uh, degree overcrossings are really in one optical layer. That will increase the the uh, channel density, for example, in a fan out, we can, we can cross over each other saving space uh, and real estate on a board. Another, uh, let's say, indication of a, of a, of a process, uh, let's say, um, uh, uh, variability is that we can fundamentally uh, uh, add the optical layer virtually uh, in um, anywhere we need it in the stack. We can utilize the full layer, or we can use it partially as these materials are photodefinable. So here is a couple of um, uh, examples of a potential stack ups with one of or more optical layers. So on the on the left hand side, you see single layer being buried in a in a middle, or then two layers uh, uh, being positioned on top and bottom side, quite close to the surface. In a, in a middle section, we see that we can do them partially just to use the space that we need for these optical traces. We don't need to, to, to utilize the whole layer. So um, any variation or combination is, is possible uh, as the materials are, are uh, processable with these uh, 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 flexible ways. Um, design tools are are being uh, obviously necessary to, to provide an uh, inducer potential to add the optical functionality. So EDA tool and EDA tool vendors uh, have taken actions to have um, photonic layout uh, capabilities in their software. Here are a couple of mentions, numerical cadence or light suit from vendor graphics. So both the simulation and the design um, obviously would be ideal to to be uh, accomplished within one uh, design environment uh, with all the ne needed uh, component libraries and design rule sets. And that's obviously the, the work which is in progress in, in, in many of these vendors. Obviously we can carry out the simulation uh, using a um, standalone or external environment and then feed in the, the design into the rout routing layout tool. Uh, each, uh, let's say, uh, material or, or OPCB vendor has a database for, for their specific material, which is uh, supported by experiment, experimentally validated design rules for their photonic components, uh, for their minimum bend radius, the overcrossing channels, uh, and, and so forth. But, but adding these into the, the, uh, the, the design tool gives uh, a, a fairly comprehensive tool set to be used um, for designing the OE PCBs. Uh, then uh, obviously we, we discussed on the termination. So termination is a critical part of realizing the, the, um, the, uh, the practical end-to-end -end, uh, link. We need a coupling to uh, fibers. We need a coupling to devices. Here are a couple of uh, examples of an industry um, efforts and, uh, and, and demonstrations for waveguide compatible optical connectors from various um, uh, companies and, and, uh, and research groups now for waveguide to fiber connection. Um, we see that the connectors vary in their, uh, uh, let's say, type, either they are kind of edge connectors, 
having an in-plane connection, or they can have the 90 degree turn, which is fundamentally needed if the component sits on top of the board and you need to come, uh, come up with the light uh, towards the waveguide and, and turn the light by 90 degree. Uh, obviously, the connector solutions vary in their in their complexity or or in their alignment procedure to to waveguide, but maturity of the of the um, connector solution that we show here and and what has been uh, demonstrated in the industry follow um, the standard uh, connector types like MT or MPO uh, as we see here. Uh, some functional test results. Um, as mentioned, the waveguide, uh, dis for the waveguide practical design um, and simulation purposes, we need ex exper experimentally validated test results. And uh, here are some snapshot of, of the measurement results of uh, uh, TTM's waveguides for incision loss, crosstalk, cross uh, over loss, and bent loss. So we do this uh, routinely for, for every and each of the materials that we have. We look at um, the main characteristics with uh, different launch conditions. Um, and for uh, particularly when we talk about the multiple waveguides at 850 nanometer wavelength, we can look at them obviously under different um, uh, uh, 1310 or 1550 as well, but the main application for multimode resides to the 850. So maturity of the testing is done at that wavelength. Um, these numbers will give you uh, 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 the design rule sets that you're needing in order to, to, to complete the, the physical layout and simulation uh, performance. Another uh, testing obviously is done at the SI side. Um, Joshua presented the simulation uh, uh, extensively done. Here we show um, the uh, uh, experimental tested um, I diagrams at 13 and, and, and uh, 20 and 30 gigabits per second uh, NRC and then 20 and, and 50 gig PAM4 correspondingly. So in this case, we uh, looked at very long, extensively long waveguide, 94 um, centimeter long, which was a, a fundamentally a, a spiral uh, built on a board. Um, no terminations in this case, it was a polymeric, um, waveguide. So the eye diagrams indicate that we have a good performance in the in even with a very long waveguide in this case. Then a couple of words on the on the previous uh, let's say the collaboration programs. Industry obviously have been looking at the the waveguide technology and uh, here we uh, 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 flash out the um, US driven uh, collaborative industry effort uh, eight, under HD Park. HD Park is a US-driven uh, collaboration, and this was one of the one of the largest uh, non-funded activity within the industry recently. In this program, uh, the group demonstrated multiple waveguide technologies, uh, uh, two polymer technologies being uh, a flex and uh, an embedded waveguide in nature, as well as a glass waveguide technology. So it was a showcase of, uh, of uh, technologies, uh, different vendors, and more so uh, the project um, demonstrated the technologies with the, with the mod, uh, modular uh, demonstrator chassis, which was later uh, standardized under IEC TC86 joint working group number nine. So test platform combined different uh, technologies from various vendors, both on the engines on the connectors and the waveguide technologies. And another pr uh, project I want to highlight is, is, a, uh, is, a, is a significant uh, EU effort, uh, European consortium, uh, uh, which uh, um, could combine uh, in, um, 20 company and, and academic institutes to develop uh, technologies for next generation application. So Foxtrot, uh, here is the uh, Foxtrot's final um, rack level demonstrator platform that had really an application specific optical demonstrator designs. Here on the left hand side, we see Aurora, a multimode optical interconnect platform where we uh, developed and, and showcased um, various connector uh, uh, coupling solutions, particularly. And, and uh, below that is a Pegasus 
which was an application, uh, optically disaggregated, uh, disaggregated object-oriented platform, test platform, more for uh, application uh, scenario. And uh, moreover, the project looked at, at as well single mode technology and, and, and various other um, enabling technologies. Now, uh, finally, uh, obviously the Kobo new working group uh, Joshua uh, is leading is a multi-mode waveguide interconnect system. So now this newly established um, uh, group will focus on, on um, really uh, de defining the specification for the electrical and uh, optomechanical specification. So combining the industry efforts and, and expertise and, and knowledge we have gained, um, we are now going to um, uh, provide another, let's say, platform for uh, specification and detailing uh, the technologies uh, uh, therein. Uh, as mentioned, it's, it will cover the, all the technical, critical technical areas, embedded waveguides and PCBs, the connectors, and then the device portion. With that, I'm going to come to the summary and conclusion. So obviously uh, being indicated and motivated for us, power has become, became the first order issue and drive new solutions for development. Um, we see that hybrid PCBs with copper and optical offers a viable 112 to 224 solution. We don't need three timers, no cables, and we can exploit the best of both worlds. Um, industry and, and TTM do have a capability to build optical PCBs uh, using standard high volume scalable processes. Um, multi-mode technology and multi-mode waveguide technologies is mature, lower cost and, and, and robust uh, thinking of comparison to single mode technology. Um, obviously, uh, uh, call for action need to start defining ta a targeted channel specification of the mechanical specification early on for um, uh, uh, multi-mode interconnect system vendor compliance and ecosystem partnering here is a key. So we need to have all, uh, all players to work together to develop uh, within the same um, pace and roadmap to bring uh, multi-sourcing and technology readiness across uh, materials connectors, EMS test developers to align these to customer roadmaps and, and industry readiness. With that, I thank you and hand it over to, to, Jim. to you. Yeah. Correct, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Marika, and, and thank you, Joshua, both uh, very inspiring presentations. I, I think we can see um, from the level of technical detail that you've both presented that there's quite a lot going on in this space and uh, tremendous potential for future design. So we have about 15 minutes now for Q&A. We've had a couple of questions come in from the Q&A function already, but um, everyone else in the audience, you are encouraged to send your questions our way. Um, this webcast will be available as an archive, by the way, um, probably in the next few days, certainly by next week. The slides also will be available for people to use um, and to, to review. So with that, let's jump over to the questions. So Joshua, there's um, a couple right here from you for, for the beginning. Um, in the 352 femtojoules per bit, um, when you mentioned that, are you also including the power penalty in the CDR that is needed after the TIA? If so, what kind of CDR that has to be used to have such lower low power? Because even XSR RX has higher power than that. So I think there's going to be a couple of questions coming to you, Joshua, about power consumption. Okay. So you mentioned about the XSR. That XSR should drive uh, this from here to this point. And the XSR and the CDR uh, is co-located in this uh, uh, MPO or CPO cases. This electronics is meant to be, meant to drive the fiber all the way up to the outside the world. Whereas uh, MU's case, the optics is uh, at most within this. So in this fiber world, they call that, this length, they call that back-to-back -back test. 
So even you, you're thinking of another CDR, but for the back-to-back uh, -back test, you don't, uh, people don't normally consider as another CDR to <laughs> test it. So, so as I mentioned, uh, the uh, electrical interface and optic, uh, electrical interface and optical interface is very, very short compared to general uh, backplane connection or chip to chip connections, even to uh, from uh, faceplate to the other uh, system. So the overall system length is very, very tiny, very small. So you don't have to have a CDR in this case. I hope this answers the question. Okay, okay, great. Um, do you have any calculations for the power savings for 224 gig 30s for multi-mode fibers in the PCB? So actually uh, we haven't gone to the year 224 yet, but uh, basic uh, fundamental calculation method is written in the white paper which I think the, our team will send out after this webinar. Okay. Um, Joshua, while you, you may have your slides there, um, you showed about a 30% misalignment for the, the TX taper. Is the link insertion loss more sensitive for RX taper misalignment after additional mode excitation during propagation? Yeah, there, there must be, a, as I said, it is not exhaustive test yet, but uh, you have to do a lot of combinations, not only that uh, DMIS case, but also the, uh, from the laser source to that, uh, to that coupler and coupler to the uh, waveguide and waveguide also interference, uh, inter uh, interference with the uh, uh, turnings and overlay of the, the other waveguides and those details of uh, stuff should be, should be, uh, should be done uh, as an exhaustive analysis. But for this, uh, we, uh, we haven't done, in this paper, we haven't done a first order, you know, a viability check test, so. Okay. Yeah. All right, great. Some questions from Marika. Um, it would be great if you could elaborate, how does the waveguide PCB handle the couple for PD and laser driver for this setup? Um, there are multiple ways to um, assemble those devices on the board. Um, we've earlier, we've, uh, we've uh, assembled the BGA type of, uh, of the devices on the board. Uh, we've used direct, um, uh, direct uh, coupling of a device uh, that is have, have partly buried in the PCB itself. And we've used even a pick tape devices. So depending upon the, uh, the device type or your uh, engine or optical engine or um, component, we do have a, a various techniques to apply for the, uh, for the waveguide to device assembly and, and coupling. Okay. Um, and there's a question asking about some more detail about the structures and material of EO OE converters. Are they include are they included in the PCB stack? Uh, the converters, if if we're talking about the connectors or the devices, devices mm -hmm. is, is is obviously a, a a device which is mm -hmm. separate from the PCB. Uh, connector or coupler could be, let's say, uh, a a and usually it, the intention is to have it as a, as a permanent part in a PCB. Um, but that's, let's say, uh, still depending upon the case. As we, as we saw, um, some, some uh, engines may have an optical coupler part of it, but in, 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 in many cases, we may want to have uh, the optical uh, interface directly uh, onto on the board so that we can test, we can ship the product as a terminated, connectorized PCB, if you will, um, so that we secure the interfaces um, when the product leaves the, leaves the, uh, the, the, the gate. So uh, again, there are pros and cons for bo both approaches, but I would say that the permanent uh, interface in PCB would, is the target. And now we are seeing as well, um, 
couplers that are reflow compliant, because obviously that's going to be the first question as well. Uh, anything uh, plastic or, or plastic parts may not withstand these high temperatures uh, that are required in the component assembly. So that's going to be setting the first uh, first uh, uh, requirement set that uh, any optical uh, entities or parts that we assemble on board needs to be reflow compliant. Uh, Joshua, any any comment on that? So that uh, it should be the uh, separate uh, component. Uh, it's not uh, embedded in that uh, in the stack up because it creates a lot of uh, cost factors in there. So the, for the industry to take to take this MS approach, it should be the uh, MA media adapter is separate entity so that uh, only solder balls or those kind of uh, mechanical alignment should be used to assemble onto the board. But even, even uh, you know, mechanical structures will uh, create a uh, cost factor as well. Okay. Um, Marika, could you comment on the availability of these um, PCB board designs and mm -hmm wave guide couplers and the expected timeline of when this would become commercially viable yeah as we as we see a lot of a lot of progress has been achieved and, and a lot of uh, development has been uh, uh done uh, uh, around the building blocks uh we know that that there is not a product in the market yet uh implementing or using waveguides for for this application that we described today um the readiness exists, so it's not going to be a, a huge long lead time activity, I mean, uh, in uh, industry in general, but we need this um, uh, type of um, collaboration and interface, uh, 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 let's say, agreements and definitions and um, standardization that we are now doing uh, as well in, in this COBO working group so that we do have um, um, let's see, st near standardized products or near standardized um, uh, components that can, can be delivered. So within one to three years, we are gonna see this uh, popping up into the market. Okay, okay, great. Uh, so maybe we should uh, answer some of the other questions about the Kobo uh, working group. Um, so there's one that asks to clarify the main intended use cases in the MWIS working group. Joshua's presentation implied that it is primarily to replace the LR30s for connection of ASIC to the faceplate pluggables, in which case isn't this a direct competitor to co-packaged optics, whose goal is also to replace the LR30s with low power 30s. But yeah, um, yeah so, so maybe could you comment on that, Joshua? Yeah, I think the, uh, that's correct observation, but it's uh, the time. The timeline is matters because core package optics is all, already in the you know on the on the spot right now, and uh, many companies is looking that as uh, solutions. But I would see this is an interim solution. So for the future proof solution, uh, it is a little bit of uh, it has really bit of issues in terms of uh, you know manufacturing and system integrations but in the end uh, changing the it is not typically on LR solution it could be VSR MR uh, whatever solution even XSR solutions you could actually change it that uh, couple trace to multimode waveguide so it 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 applies all high speed track in PCB in the box or you know backplane. So it not only LR but also everything in PCB uh, embedded waveguide. Also, uh, to CPO is very good technology to save the power right now at this point. So it, it matters dear how the roadmap and timelines uh, can uh, you know, support this. Uh, overall changes of the you know innovations okay uh, so, so um, we talked a lot about the power savings uh, that are available any um, comment on reliability concerns uh, of using this approach oh, I, I could comment on the the PCB wise 
obviously new technology being, uh, let's say, implemented into, into existing products um, um, needs to be tested vastly. But now we, we know that the, ma the material vendors who have been uh, visibly uh, providing uh, their materials inherent practically from the PCB material. So the material sets are not so, so distinct from a regular dielectrics uh, could be, but let's say advanced uh, uh, materials. So they have been tested um, per se. So as a materials, as well as part of, part of this, uh, 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 let's say hybrid stacks uh, fairly, uh, um, fairly well. Obviously the application scenario will, will give a new uh, sets of tests. And as we increase the complexity by these additional coupling elements and devices, that's another, let's say, set of testing required. So board, board and, the, and the, the optical waveguide materials are quite well tested already. The, the system level testing is something which we, the industry has to address down the road. Okay. Um, just a, a question for clarification here as well. Um, somebody writes, the eye diagram shown in Marika's slide don't show the nonlinearity in Joshua simulations. Is there a difference? Um, and could you, could you comment on that? That's a good question because that's uh, the length and the speed is not uh, at the at the same uh, speed and at the same uh, length because uh, it has a very low speed uh, compared to the length that uh, they tested by Americas uh, test. So ten gig and twenty gig. Whereas this one is 100 gig and 200 gig uh, distances. I mean, uh, yeah, results. Okay, uh, we're almost at the top of the hour. So we just have um, time for a couple more questions. Um, it looks like there's more questions and we're going to be able to answer okay. today, but we'll get back to everyone. If we didn't uh, get to your question yet, we will respond uh, as soon as we can. Um, Another big concern, and maybe this is the last one, um, we can get response from both of you on the cost estimates uh, of this. Um, of course, it's early days, but since we're talking about PCB manufacturing costs, are they going to increase in the num when you bring in optical layers? Uh, from the PCB perspective, uh, the materials obviously are, are, are new, but but so are these new dielectrics that we have to accommodate for 100, 100 and 224 node. So material and process wise, as, as we hopefully, uh, let's say highlighted, we are using the standard technology as far as we can. And currently as the materials, uh, these optical materials are, are photo definable, they, they comply with the existing infrastructure. We can, we can use uh, photo imaging tools that we use today. Uh, and processes, um, lamination or coating. So process and materials uh, will not be the, let's say the key uh, cost adders for the PCB or PCB. Uh, industry has to come up with the, with, the, with the conclusion on the assembly of the parts because the active alignment is, is really something which adds the cost obviously uh, with, the, with the tack time or uh, time and, and then the cost itself. So assembly, the devices, the couplers, there, there is the cost pressure uh, for the industry. And, and, and finally, any, um, you highlighted design tools. Are, do we need more design tools or better integration between those tools and, and the manufacturing? I think the, uh, the design tools uh, should design uh, industry to uh, focus on the, uh, how that the optical design side is familiar, uh, make the familiar to electrical design engineers. That's the key aspect. That's why I, I like to address the uh, electrically equivalent as parameter extraction uh, tools should be needed. Okay, well, um, at this point, we are at the top of the hour, so um, we'll have to end our uh, webinar, but I want to thank both of you, Joshua and Marika, uh, fantastic presentations. Um, I, I think everybody will have benefited from uh, what you presented here today. 
we'll we'll get back to as many people as we can in the audience who've um, left a question and we weren't able to answer. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Kobo for um, presenting this webinar and for DuPont um, Silicon Valley Technology Center for, for hosting it. So with that, thank you everyone and um, see you next time. Thank you.